to see all the, f the familiar faces here. Um, Paul obviously has a real fan club, um, <laughs> but I have notes. I'm, I'm, I'm totally delighted to introduce Paul Laskowski. Paul um, is here to discuss, as you can see, supply chains, their graph structure, and their role in information industries. Um, many of you already know Paul. He's been a friend uh, of the iSchool for a long time. He got his PhD here, and now he's a visiting assistant professor, um, and he's been critical to helping us develop the uh, MIDS program, Master of Information and Data Science program. Um, Paul, uh, Paul's research is on competition in network industries, including government policy and how it interacts with computer architecture. Um, he's looked at net neutrality, uh, future network architectures, and markets for personal information. Paul has a distinguished <laughs> past. He got a, um, a BA in applied math from Harvard. Uh, he was a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon Portugal program, and he also worked as a developer for Project Indigo, an agent-based modeling environment. And last but not least, <laughs> I love this one, he was on the founding board of a national gymnastics organization. <laughs> and with that, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, it's okay if I just yell, I think. Right? Yes. I, I, can, I can be loud. I'm always too loud when, when I talk. Um, thank you, Anna. I, I, yeah, I don't know what to say after that fantastic introduction. I'm so grateful to, to Anna, both for, uh, well, in general, for bringing me back to work with the program here. Uh, it's just been such a mo uh, just a momentous time uh, for, for me to have been through the, the program over the last year, and definitely for bringing me in to, to speak today. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be, I, I think, part of the, 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 the Dean's Lecture Series. And it's especially meaningful for me um, actually, because the last time I was in this building giving a talk, uh, it was my PhD defense. So I was, I was just down the hall, and um, ah, there I was. At least, th th okay, this is how I remember it, at least in, in my own memory. There I was, you know, uh, bright eyed young uh, PhD researcher, and still, you know, giddy from the, the thrills of double blind peer review. And, and you know, I, I put on my best fancy attire, I, I tucked in my shirt back then. Um, I really, I put up a professional set of slides. I wanted to embody, you know, the dignity, a, a dignity that would be worthy of this, this institution. Um, by contrast, today I like making slides with koalas on them. <laughs> this is, you can, you can partly blame uh, Koi, Koi Cheshire for, for leading by example here, since uh, I know that he's fond of certain animal, animal photos. Uh, but, but these guys are here for a reason. Of course, this is, this is really my favorite supply chain. I, I don't even know what they're supplying. I'm sure it's critically important for our economy. Uh, maybe it's something like fluffy research, something like that. <laughs> I, I hope you guys like these guys because there's a lot more actually coming later. Like, so I know as I get started here, you know, I, I have some explaining to you because you might be wondering why I'm talking about supply chains at an information school, right? I mean, I was a student here and here at the information school, you know, we're really focused on information industries, the most modern industries that are being developed here today. Uh, we put up pictures. I, I gave a lot of talks here at this school with pictures like this, networks and fiber optics and futuristic things. Um, uh, well, by, by the way, have you guys noticed that every time you look for information, like uh, you do a Google search for information, it comes up blue. You know, your whole screen turns out blue. Um, you can try it now. I can wait. Yeah. Well, I have a theory. I think, I think this is because us information scientists look great in, in blue light. I mean, you can see Tom Cruise looks great. Uh, John Chuang looks great in, in blue light. Um, I, think, I think these are uh, co-stars in an upcoming Minority Report, too, where John is in charge of a dystopian, uh, futuristic government agency that has to pre-authenticate people. But this is a problem, of course, because if this represents information, when you think about supply chains, you know, I think the pictures that you come up with might be more tinted in sepia, or I, I don't know if there's a color, like brown or something like that. Uh, we're used to thinking of supply chains as more of a, a 20th century sort of phenomenon, right? Um, but so is, is this really a step towards the past? Well, the first thing, and really my, my biggest point almost that I want to argue today, is that actually supply chains are still with us, and they're in fact more relevant than ever. Um, in fact, I see supply chains popping up um, in the most modern of, in, of industries, in, in information industries, certainly. Um, and I think it's more pressing than ever for us to find tools to study supply chains. 
Okay, so I know this sounds a little bit strange, right? I mean, to think about supply chains when it comes to information. Um, but what is a supply chain? Now, I guess we better start there, right? So here's, here's one working definition. At least this is a starting point, right? Uh, we think of a supply chain as some industry, and of course you have some firm, right? And that firm needs uh, inputs. It needs an, at least one input uh, before it can sell its output, right? Um, and maybe if there's multiple inputs, then it needs those inputs in some specific proportion to each other. Um, the other way that you could maybe think about this is that, you know, uh, it's, a, it's an industry with at least two markets, right? If a market is a place where goods change hands from one player to another player, you have to have at least two markets, and then you have a supply chain industry. Now, there's one element that's, that I did not include here, right? Uh, and that's any notion of physical assembly. So this is why this may seem odd, because we're used to manufacturing, we're used to thinking of taking parts and gluing them together, right? But as economists, of course, we have to ask, is there anything sacred about the, the nuts and the bolts uh, that hold materials together that make a supply chain a supply chain? Um, and I would say, as economists, we care about incentives, right? Um, it's the incentive structure of an industry that dictates behavior. And an economic model doesn't bother with whether firms are working with lumber or metal or what other material. Um, and I would argue it doesn't matter even if the material is tangible, right? So the same definition should extend towards, you know, information goods, intangible goods, uh, perhaps contracts, rights, permissions, uh, bits of information. All of these could play a role in a supply chain as long as they're necessary for the production process to continue. So, you know, when you start thinking about supply chains this way, uh, with a more general definition, you really, you, you see them popping up in all kinds of places. So I'll give you a few examples, just as a, as simple examples as just a warm up to get us thinking about supply chains. So if you're a mapping firm, you wanna give out driving directions, maybe a, a service that provides driving directions. Well, you need to start with some geographic coordinates. You need to know where the, where the roads are. So in the old days, you might just buy a set of geographic data, sort of from, a, from maybe a mapping company. <clears throat> of course, this technology has improved. Um, you know, th this is sort of the, the early way of doing things. Now, of course, these firms need real-time traffic data. And they get real-time traffic data from a variety of sources, right? There's, there's satellites, some traffic, uh, uh, taxi companies will sell real-time traffic data now. Uh, there's these rather eerie-looking traffic cameras that we have popping up. Um, so as the technology has changed, so too has this supply chain, right? Um, you could even think about the user as a portion of the supply chain. Um, the user needs some sort of device in order to view uh, these driving directions. So perhaps it, it, you could just use a, a mobile phone, for example, or maybe if we're thinking about something like those GPS units for hikers, maybe the mapping firm itself buys that unit and then sells a bundle onto consumers. So again, getting, getting quite complicated here. The next example, um, okay, maybe this is a bit more of a 20th century example, but just to imagine that you're a computer manufacturer. Uh, so, of course, we, we appreciate that if you're in this industry, typically you'll buy, you know, silicon chips and other hardware from some other supplier. Um, but not all of your inputs are tangible like that, right? Um, maybe your product infringes on certain patents. So you need to purchase patent rights, perhaps, from some inventor out there who has a, a patent that covers your technology. Um, and then there's software, right? Typically, you might purchase an operating system from, from some other supplier. Um, and there's a whole uh, story to be told about other software, of course, right? All the applications that run on your computer. Um, this could be sold in different ways. It could be sold directly to the user. Sometimes it'll be uh, sold to the manufacturer and then bundled and sold on to the user. Um, and actually, this is a good example to look at because it's a place where you can imagine the government often plays a role, right? So maybe the government comes along and says, okay, uh, maybe web browsing software has to be sold directly to the end user. You can't block this part of the supply chain. And so government regulation can come and change the shape of these supply chains. So one more fun one. Let's say that you make those uh, tablet e-readers, the, the e-reading devices like the, the Kindle, right? So if you wanna sell these to consumers, well, consumers want to be able to download the, the books, their, their newspapers, and their reading material. So what you might do is you might purchase wireless service, right, from a wireless provider. Um, and then, of course, over here, we, you imagine we also need content. So maybe the content is sold directly to users, or at times it might be sold to the company and then bundled, sold as a bundle to the users. 
Uh, we've seen both of these things happen. And making things even more complicated, we've actually, um, a, a different supply chain also exists in the same industry. So sometimes you'll see a scenario where the tablet manufacturer sells tablets to the wireless provider. And then you can buy a, a, you know, a, a tablet complete with wireless service from um, your, your wireless company. So it's actually a, a bit puzzling if you think about it, how uh, a company in this industry can be both upstream and downstream at the same time, right? You might think that if uh, maybe, I'll come back to this point a little bit later, but if you assume that there's a particular advantage maybe to being upstream or downstream in this industry, then maybe the dominant firm would muscle into the uh, advantageous position, for example. Okay, but more on that later. Uh, for now, I mean, the whole point of this is, is mainly just that these supply chains really do exist today in these industries. Um, and they differ from each other in, in this complicated topological, by the topology, I mean which way these arrows point, right? How they're directed from player to player. Um, so it's really important for us to be able to study these. But immediately, if you want to study these types of supply chains, you run into a problem. <clears throat> I, I would suggest that we really need you know, a, a theoretical, an economic theory that allows us to study these supply chains um, at the level of an economic framework. Um, so I, I'm not just talking about, you know, fancy uh, maybe machine learning algorithms that could do great prediction in supply chain industries. Um, those wouldn't give us the human intuition, which is something that I think is also, I mean, th those are, of course, very important, but also important is, you know, having a human understanding, a human readable understanding of how these industries work. So we need some economic basis. We want to take economic models, basic economic theory, and apply them to supply chains. When you try to do this, it turns out that even the simplest, sort of the most mathematically simple economic models don't actually extend to the complicated supply chains that I've been showing you. So you know, what, what are these simplest tools that I'm talking about? Well, things like uh, Cournot competition. So I, I hope most of you have seen Cournot competition before in, in something like an uh, introductory economics class. Um, Cournot competition is, is you know, perhaps, or even probably, the most popular economic model uh, in, in probably all of economics. Uh, the basic idea is you have firms, so two firms here, uh, and they choose quantities to produce, so number of units of an operating system or of a computer and so forth. So I'll use X for these. So firm one produces X1 units, firm two produces X2 units. Um, we take the sum of those, right? Here's the, the sum, the total, the total quantity produced. And then this total quantity goes into a demand function. And a, a demand function is a tool that economists use that relates demand to the price that clears that demand, the price that consumers are willing to pay. And the simplest possible demand function, which also probably not coincidentally pops up over and over in, in economics, is just this linear one. And it says that the final price of each good, so P sub I, is just one minus the total quantity. So it, it may, maybe it's unrealistic, but it's so mathematically simple that it's, it's clearly the most popular demand function that you see out there in the modeling world. Okay, so you know, I mentioned this is probably the most popular tool, I would say really in all of economics. And you might wonder why. Well, partly it's just, you know, it's so simple, right? It's, when, you, when you take an economic tool and you want to study actual industries, there's these details that, that creep in. You want to sort of account for unique features of that industry. And if you begin with a model that's really simple, it leaves you room to add complications, to add descriptors, and so forth. Um, so being simple is really an advantage when you try to model the real world. Um, there's also the fact that these firms here have market power, okay? So that means that they don't actually compete away their prices to, to zero. They can make a profit. Uh, that seems almost uh, like it should go without saying, right? But if, for example, these firms chose prices instead of quantities, um, this is also a, a tool that exists in economics, but each of these firms would want to, you know, slash its price to maybe one penny below its competitor's price, they can end up competing their prices away to zero. So in fact, they don't have any market power. They don't earn any profit. That's much more unrealistic, and we, we don't want to, we want to capture that market power in our models. Okay, so for all these reasons, you know, corner competition, it, it seems like a great candidate, right? This seems like sort of a perfect tool that we'd want to apply to supply chains. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, let's try to do that. And, you know, th there are researchers who have tried to apply Cournot competition to supply chains. And I'll tell you about how far we've gotten. Um, for the most part, actually, this is it. 
So this is what we call a wholesale retail market, right? It's, it's a chain of two markets. A set of wholesalers sell to a set of retailers, and then they sell to consumers. OK. Um, so you know, th this, is, this is nice to see. Um, it turns out, however, that, and, and I want to say, you know, actually, these wholesale retail markets, this is really 99.9. I, I, I'll bank on at least three nines. I'm not sure how many nines I want to. I want to stake a claim to, but at least 99.9% .9 of the supply chain literature deals with exactly this market, uh, simply a wholesale retail market. Um, but there's already a problem, right? We already run into trouble here because, you know, we want these firms to choose quantities, right? Um, but there's a problem. The quantities have to match, right? We need the same quantity that's um, outputted by the wholesalers to be the quantity that passes through all the way to consumers. Uh, or at least they have to be close, right? We, we don't believe that um, in the wild we don't see sort of stockpiles of engines, of car engines just building up because there's not enough cars to put them in, right? That tends to not happen. So we want the quantities to match, but if both these firms select quantities, there's no mechanism in place to ensure that that happens. And so to actually make this work, you have to, um, you have to choose some modeling compromises, right? You can't, you can't have this perfect model. So there's actually, at this point, a lot of different things have been tried. Researchers have come up with a lot of creative ways to try to fix this. So one thing you can do is you can just assume perfect competition in one of these markets, right? So maybe you, you look at the wholesalers, you assume that there's just a huge number of wholesalers, so they don't earn any profit. Um, you could also assume price competition in one of these markets. Um, that's, I mean, that might seem reasonable for, for this case, but remember that Anytime we have asymmetric assumptions, so we treat these two markets with a, di a different set of assumptions, there's probably not much hope for extending this to still larger supply chains in a way that looks um, uh, coherent. So other things that you could do, you could employ some asymmetrical timing. So you could do things like let, the, let one of these groups of firms move first. Maybe the wholesalers move first. Um, this is the idea behind one really famous paper by uh, Salinger who created what I'll call the successive Cournot. I, I think this is probably the official name, the successive Cournot model. So this is a famous paper from 1988 that I'll tell you maybe a little bit uh, more about later. <clears throat> um, part of the problem there is if you have, say, the wholesalers move first, they actually gain what economists call a first mover advantage. Okay. And uh, this actually means that they can extract If that seems, but if you get to move first, you get to predict what your opponent will do. Um, and in a sense, that gives you an advantage. So in this, in this type of model, it's much nicer to be upstream. Um, again, that's asymmetric. Um, I, I don't have any good data on this, but just anecdotally, I don't think this matches um, our experience with what we see in the wild. For example, remember the example where um, sometimes you'll see firms that are perfectly happy being both upstream or downstream. Um, I study networking with John, and uh, the, the residential access networks are, are two very powerful firms that really enjoy their downstream position. So it's actually the opposite of what this type of model predicts. So for this reason, we may be suspicious of, of this type of asymmetrical timing. Um, another problem is that these games that employ asymmetrical timing, uh, they also tend to actually violate basic principles of game theory. Right? So what do I mean? Well. There's no game, actually, in these papers. So all the, a game sounds fancy, but really all that a game is in economics is you write down the strategies that every player has, and then you have to write down their payoffs for every possible choice of strategies. Um, it's actually pretty fundamental. Uh, beyond that, you have solution concepts. There's a lot more game theory. But this is a very fundamental thing that we'd really like to do. And it turns out that for these papers, including Salinger's papers, you actually can't do that. It's not a well-formed game. That means that you can't use Nash equilibria. You can't use the usual solution concepts that we're used to using in, inside economics. So what about um, more than two markets? Um, I, I said there's almost no attempts beyond two markets. So there are a few. Um, I can mention a few right now. Uh, there's one really neat paper by Majumdar and Srinivasan. Um, they have a model that looks at a larger supply chains, uh, but it's based on contract negotiation. Firms offer contracts to each other. Uh, they make take it or leave it offers. Um, and there's no actual competition in that model, so it's actually not as related to, to what I've been working on. Um, another interesting lineage comes from uh, Corbett and Karmarkar and then uh, Carr and Karmarkar. 
And what they've actually done is they've extended Salinger's 1988 model, so the successive Cournot model, uh, to more complicated supply chains. Um, so th this is a really nice achievement, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this actually in a couple of slides. Um, for right now, we just want to mention very, brief very briefly that um, this lineage uh, does face both the second and the third difficulties that I've mentioned. So they still do have the asymmetrical timing. They still don't have a well-formed game definition. <clears throat> well, okay, I I've told you about the problems. Um, today, I'm going to show you how to overcome, actually, all of these disadvantages um, in just one uh, model. So that's, that's, the big, that's the big plan for today. Um, this is actually work that I started while I was doing my, my postdoc over at CMU. Uh, so I, I know a, a couple of you guys will recognize this gentleman. This is, this is Pedro Ferreira. Um, he looks great tinted in, in blue as well, as, as, as you can see. So Pedro was actually a postdoc of, of working with John uh, when I was here as a student, so we met there. And then a couple of years later, I became Pedro's um, uh, postdoc. I was trying to think of how that worked. Um, over at CMU, so, so he became my postdoc and, and my co-author. Um, so it, what I'm going to share with you today is, is a modeling framework. Um, it's a framework to model supply chains uh, with these complex topologies that we've seen, arbitrary topologies. And we'll have core no competition in every market. Um, we're going to have a perfectly symmetric timing of decisions. Um, we're going to follow a well-specified game theoretic structure. We'll use Nash equilibria, all the usual mechanics of game theory. Um, it's going to actually extend to a wider range of supply chains than any of the papers have done before. And also, unlike the papers that I showed you before, which stuck to linear demand functions, I'll show you how to do it with a much larger class of demand functions. <clears throat> so here's, here's the plan. Uh, that was the introduction. This is the actual plan for the, the talk. So the plan is first, let's, let's, I want to spend a few minutes maybe more philosophically talking about the field, topology, and how it relates to information economics. Um, then I'll talk about how we describe supply chains. So I won't put any actual economics into it yet, just how can we mathematically describe the, the shape of supply chains. So I think even if you don't sort of buy the modeling efforts that, that, I've, that I've been working on, I, I think this could be generally useful. Then I'll go into the economics. We'll actually talk about how can we predict behavior inside a supply chain. And then I decided to end with an example. So this is an example that I've worked with quite a bit. It comes from you know, the topic of net neutrality. Um, this is a field in which there are a lot of supply chains that, that you can see. And so uh, I, I'll just finish by sort of taking the model that I've been working on out for a spin and show you how it can be applied to sort of a real world debate. <clears throat> so let's begin by talking about you know, topology and information economics. Um, here, here, so here you can see another supply chain in the wild. Uh, these, uh, and, and maybe I, I think lemurs are fond of a ring topology, it seems. Um, I, you know, I've noticed, so uh, I, it may be just because I keep staring at pictures of koalas and lemurs. I'm not sure, but I keep using the phrase firms in the wild, or as we see, you know, you know players behave in nature and so forth. Um, and, and it actually makes sense to me intuitively because, you know, I mean, as economists and, and information scientists, we are natural scientists. So it makes sense to me to say this is what we see firms doing in the wild as opposed to in our models. But it's actually not really an economics term because economists, I think, don't usually say in the wild. I, I don't know why. They like to say in the real world. And, and that's always just seemed odd to me because it's like, it's, it's like trying so hard to sort of make sure that we understand. I, like, I've never seen this confusion. I've never seen economists argue with each other. Then one stops and says, oh, wait, you mean in the real world? And then, and then they sort of resolve their differences. So um, it, doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to happen. And sometimes they also say, in real life. And when, they, and when you say firms in real life, it makes me feel like I'm taking that drive back from the dentist and, and somebody's trying to make me, you know, figure out an economics problem on the way. So, um, you know. in any case, this is, this is the section where um, I just want to talk about the field. I'm going to be a little bit sneaky here. I'm going to talk about the, the field of information economics. And along the way, I'm going to subtly plug a few little projects that I've been doing. In. But I'm going to do it quickly, so I, I'm hoping that you guys won't actually notice. So while I was working here, and, and, and you know, the, the field that, that you know, is trained in work, working with John is what you might call information economics. And what we do is we take tools from economics. So we take models of competition, really. So it could be neoclassical models. There could be more game theoretic models, data-driven models. 
um, we apply those to information industries, right? Um, and as researchers have done this, you know, they've noticed ways in which information industries are unique, right? There's very uh, characteristic features of, of information industries that need to inform our models. And in a lot of these cases, I, I think economists have, have really been really successful at translating classical models to the information space and coming up with really um, a lot of classic results that we now consider just, just conventional wisdom. So we know that information you know, can be non-rival. For example, you and I can have the same set of information. Um, information can be expensive to produce, but very cheap to copy, right? So it has low marginal costs. Um, information goods always often have network effects, right? So um, how much I value a product might depend on how many of you are using the same product, right? In all of these cases, you know, we've been really successful. We've taken models of competition from sort of more classic economics, ported them over, and come up with really interesting results. Um, when I arrived at the school, I realized that there was one characteristic of information networks where um, we really have much more work to do. And that's the fact that information industries um, can have a really complicated, a really rich topology. They can have these, these interesting topological features. And this is something that can really make information industries different. So I'll give you just a few quick examples. Um, <clears throat> When I first came here, I, I worked with John, and I started learning about computer networks, especially problems in things like network routing. So in today's internet, you might have to take data and send it from a source to a destination, right? And it might have to pass through a couple of these nodes in between representing other internet service providers. So network routing is the selection of a path from the source to the destination. And you can ask questions like, what type of market should support this, right? Who should make the decision? Should the, the sender make the decisions? Should the, the ISPs along the route make those decisions about which way the data goes? Um, what type of monitoring? What type of information do you need about performance for this market to function? How should the contracts be structured? Um, I, don't, I, mean, I don't want to tell you about my contribution so much as just point out that all of these problems are so rooted in this topology, it, it doesn't even make sense to ask them, right? So. Um, this, this type of, of, of problem that really forces you to, to generate models that um, take topology as a critical input. Um, later, I started a project just as I was leaving Berkeley that, that looked at uh, virtualization interfaces. So this is uh, a network architectural technique that researchers have come up with in the hopes of supporting next, gener ge next generation services or future networks. Right? It consists of this this idea called a virtualization interface. And this is a technology that we think would allow different service providers to run network services on top of our existing um, network infrastructure. So this could be things that sort of look like the internet that we have today, but maybe they're tailored to special purposes, to video traffic, to high priority traffic, and so forth. Um, but if we'd like to imagine that these things could happen one day, well, the question is, how could we pay for them? How could we fund them? And there's different ideas, right? You could have service providers sell a service to a network provider that then sells a bundle to the end user. You could imagine the opposite, where the network provider sells to the service provider and then the user gets a bundle. You could imagine something like a mix and match market, where both types of firms sell directly to the end user. OK, so you know, just a question is, does this matter? Actually, in, in a paper that, that John and I worked on, we, we argue that, in fact, it does matter. This, this is a topological consideration that classic tools don't recognize really as a problem, but it can have an impact on market outcomes. OK, I have one more, one more quick example. Um, this, is, this is a project. So actually, I have two very talented uh, students in the MIMS program back there, so Toshiro and Sean. And, and uh, I've been leading them on a project over this, this last semester. We've been investigating um, fraud in in a virtual currency like Bitcoin. So as you all probably know, um, Bitcoin is a currency that's in a sense anonymous or, or rather pseudonymous. So it's very hard to tie particular accounts within Bitcoin to individuals. Um, at the same time, the complete history of payments in Bitcoin is just publicly known. It's, it's visible in a transaction record known as the, the blockchain. Right? So, so what these students are working on right now is actually creating a tool that searches for suspicious transactions 
um, it has to take this topology as a critical input because hidden within this topology is information about which of these addresses might be related to each other. And as, as a result of that topology, they're, they're trying to generate estimations of how likely those relationships are. So how likely different addresses are to have the same, the same owner. So a uh, really interesting project that they're working on. OK. That was my, that was, that was my little plug. Um, so now we'd like to move on. Take, take these topological considerations, these tools, and I'd like to tell you about how I translated those um, into the supply chain setting. So I, I know this, this, one's, this one stands out, actually, because I'm, I'm talking about large supply chains. And, and you might be wondering why I would put a supply chain up here with only two players. Um, but what do you notice about the relationship of these, of these uh, players or firms? Uh, yes, uh, I was thinking vertical. So they're, they're like firms in a vertical. <laughs> OK, didn't expect this to be a Socratic lecture. Right? I've been learning from Deirdre about how to engage audiences. But. Um, okay, let's, um, let's have a look at how we encode these supply chains. Oops. So I've been talking about supply chains as a graph, right? That makes a lot of intuitive sense to us, right? We imagine a supply chain has vertices or nodes and links or edges between them. Um, there's more than one way, though, to actually write down a supply chain as a graph, right? So one thing that you could do um, is you take the nodes of your graph, the, the, the vertices, and you make those represent the firms, right? Um, so this is a very intuitive approach. It's actually the approach taken by the other the related papers that, that I told you about earlier. Um, specifically, they take each node and they make it uh, a set of competing firms. So you can think about that as a, maybe a sector of the economy. Um, so that is really nice and, and intuitive. There's a drawback, though, because if you have competing firms um, locked up in the same node, they actually have to share the same set of suppliers and also the same set of distributors. And so this actually limits the, the range of supply chains that, that you can model. Um, an alternative is you take the nodes and you use the nodes to actually represent the markets. Right? And then the firms are found in between those markets and in between the market nodes. And if you, do, if you follow this approach, this is actually allows you to model more supply chains because now you can have firms compete with each other with entirely different supply networks. So maybe they have totally different technologies that they're, that they're trying to compete with, and those technologies require totally different inputs. So let me show you specifically how we can go about this with a little bit more math now. So here's a supply chain. Uh, it's going to be a graph. We'll call it G. And it's going to have nodes, V and a set of edges, E. So that's just the basic definition of a graph so far. And this supply chain is going to have three different types of nodes now. So first of all, we have the sources, because this is a directed graph. It's always directed from left to right. And we have a couple of source nodes over here. And these are what we call the inputs, or the input nodes. And we'll label that V sub I. Um, next, in, the next important class of nodes we have are interior nodes uh, that represent markets. So those are the market nodes. I, I needed a new symbol uh, to be able to, to draw these, so I just chose these sort of parentheses. Just to, these, these represent the market nodes. This is where goods actually change hands. Um, I'll label those uh, V sub M. And then it's also, we have a set of edges, uh, these edges that go into the market nodes. And I want a special name for those. I'll call those market edges, and I'll label those E sub M for, for market. And then we also have assembly nodes, so we'll call that V sub A. Um, these are the places where inputs come together. And I, I, I'm calling them assembly nodes, but you know, this is assembly just in the general sense of collecting inputs together, certainly not physical assembly. Um, we also have to assume that this graph is just one sink. right? And we'll label that C, because we want that to represent the set of consumers, so the end user, the end user market. So I told you that if we have markets as nodes, uh, the firms have to be between those markets. So what we can do to represent that, uh, we need a definition. We'll say that two of these edges or assembly nodes, so components essentially, uh, C1 and C2, we'll call them owner continuous. If there is a path between them uh, that doesn't cross any markets. right? So those are, those are components that have to be owned by the same player. And then onto this model, we have to add a set of players. So we'll just uh, use capital Y to be a set of players there. Um, and then we need a map that maps the components to those players. So we'll call that alpha. So if C1 and C2 are owner continuous, then alpha of C1 
has to equal alpha of C2. The owner of, of both of those is the same player. Okay. We almost have this described. Let's see what final products look like in this, in this type of description. So final product is the product that gets to uh, all the way to consumers. And you can think about that as a subgraph of this, of this supply chain, right? It's the subgraph that includes all the inputs that go into that final product. OK, so more formally, let's, let's use the letter small d to represent final products, right? So it's a subgraph with a couple of properties. Um, we know it has to include C. The, it has to get all the way to the consumer. Um, if you get to an assembly node, that, or like the, the last node is an assembly node, it has to also include all of the incoming edges. But if you get to a market node, this, a market node is where you have to choose between a set of suppliers. So you have to include exactly one of those incoming edges. So I hope this fits your, your idea of how, um, how the assembly process works. Uh, but we don't just need to talk about the final products. We also sometimes want to talk about the flow of inputs um, across every edge, leading from the sources to, to the consumers. Right? So we need another concept, and we'll call that a flow, or a quantity flow. So mathematically, we'll let a quantity flow be some function that assigns a quantity to every component of this graph to represent how much the, the goods are flowing towards the consumers. Um, I have a couple of assumptions here, and I hope you'll see that they actually kind of match the assumptions of the final product. So for the assumptions we have for quantity flows are first, that the flow of every node has to equal uh, the total of all of its outgoing edges. Right? And if you have an assembly node, well, the quantity there has to be the quantity at, at every incoming edge. But if you have a market node, well, the quantity has to be the total quantity of its incoming edges. So I hope you see that these are sort of two sides of the same concept. <clears throat> In fact, one of the first results that I came up with shows the relationship between these. It turns out that for every vector of final product quantity, so you can just imagine this as just a bundle of final products, an amount of final products. Well, there's a unique quantity flow that you can say generates that, that bundle of final products. Um, and it's pretty simple, actually. You just, for every component of the graph, you just sum up the amount of every final product that includes that component, and that gives you the flow. Uh, the next result that I come up with says something about the mathematical structure of, of this space. So this turns out to be really useful for the, for the proofs that, that come up. Um, it turns out that the set of all of these quantity flows, and I'll label that capital F, it turns out it has the structure of a vector space. Um, so if you know your linear algebra, this gives us a lot of mathematical tools that we could use uh, to work in this. So I'm not going to show any proofs today, but a lot of the proofs have this type of linear algebra uh, flavor. And this is what gives us a handle on this and allows us to prove some theorems. Uh, by the way, the, uh, it turns out that the dimension of this vector space has, uh, uh, has a really nice form. It's the number of market edges minus the number of market nodes and plus one. And you can drive that if you think about all of your degrees of freedom. Every time you get to an assembly node, a uh, market node, sorry, you can split up the flow in, in so many different ways. <clears throat> so there's just one more thing that we need to describe. We haven't yet talked about consumers. So consumers in economics are often described by a demand function. And I'll do the same thing here. So we'll let the small letter r sub d be the price of the final product d. OK, and then we can use a boldface r to be the vector of all of these prices. Um, this, this could be a wide class of functions, but just for starters, you know, let's assume the simplest possible demand function. So we'll assume that the price of all of the final products, again, is just 1 minus the total quantity. So actually, that's exactly the same as the demand function that I, that I put up a couple of slides ago. So OK, this is, um, now we've described everything that we need to, um, to form a, a fairly coherent picture of this industry. Right? We have the supply chain graph, that was G. We have the set of players, Y. We have the ownership map that links the two, alpha. And then finally, we have the consumer demand. So at this point, we've, we've done our description. Um, and it's time to move on to actually talking about behavior in the supply chain. Uh, this is a great supply chain, because actually in this one, you can see that the best position to be in is definitely the downstream position, not the upstream position. Okay. So again, we, we want you know, firms in the supply chain to choose quantities. Okay? So if, let's, let's let them do that directly at first. So let's say we have some market edge, E. Um, we'll let the owner of that edge choose the quantity there. And I need a letter for that. Let's call it X sub E. 
And again, we could let the bold face x be the vector of all of these quantities, right? This, these are decision variables. These are the quantities that firms choose. So I'll call this something. I'm going to call this an uncoupled Corno supply chain setup. Um, and I'll label that U of GY alpha R. So this is uncoupled because there's nothing to guarantee that the quantities match up, right? They could be in entirely different. You could have excess components, insufficient inputs, all kinds of problems. Um, I've also been careful not to call this a game, right? It's, it's not yet a game. Uh, we haven't defined any payoffs for players. Um, so how can we fix this? How can we make this, uh, or, or how can we at least ensure that these quantities match up? Well, the idea is we use price signals. We use price signals between the markets to, to coordinate those quantities. And we'll, we'll define the equilibrium in terms of the quantities um, in tandem with those prices. So we need to label the price as something now. Um, and I want you guys to think about the price charged at edge E again. But let's subtract away the price of all of the inputs that lead into edge E. So this is what economists call the markup, right? The, the price markup, the price over or net of the input costs. So we'll label that you know, X sub E with a bar over it. And again, we have you know, boldface X bar as the vector of all of those. So this is actually a really convenient quantity to focus on uh, for a lot of reasons. One reason is if you want to know how much the owner of that link earns, well, you just multiply the quantity at that link by the markup at that link. And this is the profit of, of the owner. <clears throat> OK, and so now, what does the actual solution look like? Well, let's call this a matched equilibrium. So we're, we're again, stressing the fact that we're sort of artificially constraining or trying to create a situation where the quantities match up. Um, so it has to consist of two things now. It has to have both you know, the vector of quantities and also the vector of those prices, the vector of those markups. And we need to fulfill three different conditions. Uh, we need the quantities to correspond to a valid flow. Right? So that just says that there's some flow f, so that the decision variable x sub e equals the flow at that edge. Right? Uh, we need the market to clear. So we have to fulfill the demand. So that means for, for every final product, we can compute its price. We can sum the markups over every edge that's inside that product that has to equal the price that we get from the demand function. So that's market clearance. And then finally, we need each market to be at Corno equilibrium. And those are the three things. Um, that last condition actually hides a little bit of complication. Um, if you want each, for each market to be at Corno equilibrium, you can't just say that. You actually have to specify you know, what do the firms believe happens if they change their quantities. Right? So, you, so I've chosen two conditions for that. Uh, the firms at market M have to believe that you know, if they change their quantities, if they increase their quantity by delta x, um, that increase has to be transmitted onto consumers. So the final price of all these products has to decrease by delta x. And the second belief is that when that price change happens, it's absorbed at that market. So essentially, for, for simple supply chains, this is a slightly more general formulation, but for simple supply chains, it just means that the prices at that market actually decrease by delta x. <clears throat> So given these assumptions, we have this, this solution concept that we could use to identify behaviors within the supply chain. And again, as you can see, the one big drawback so far is that this is not a properly defined game. It doesn't have a game theoretic structure. We haven't defined payoffs if these quantities don't match up with each other. Um, I'm about to fix this. I'm about to show you how to turn this into a game. Uh, but before I do that, this is actually a good time to talk about uh, the related work that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so I, I would, the main alternative, if you want to work with competitive, complicated supply chains, is, is probably the successive Cournot model. Um, this is a model that was started by Salinger in, 18, uh, oh, sorry, in 1988. Um, and he looked at a wholesale retail industry. Then Corbett and Carmichael extended that to a chain of markets, a linear chain of markets. And then Carr and Carmichael extended that to more general supply chain, so a supply chain with both sale and assembly. <clears throat> it turns out that you know, up, to what we've, up to what I've shown you so far, um, the success of Cournot model is actually surprisingly similar. So in, in fact, what I would say is that really the, the only difference is in these firm beliefs. Um, if you read these papers, it's actually presented rather differently. Uh, but if you were to try to take their model and transport it over to, to the no notation that I have, the firm beliefs would be different. Instead of believing that the markups are held fixed everywhere. 
um, the firms in this model have this type of asymmetric belief. Um, they believe that if there's a quantity change at their market M, um, that quantity change is transmitted to upstream markets. They have to change their quantities to match. But they do that, in a sense, blindly, um, leaving their prices fixed. They're no longer in equilibrium upstream. On the other hand, for firms downstream, they also have to change their quantities. But there's this circularity here, where the prices have to adjust at this node M so that the firms downstream actually re-equilibrate. So the downstream firms are always in equilibrium, and the prices change just the right amount to ensure that that happens. So <clears throat> and I mentioned before that th this type of asymmetry here essentially gives these upstream firms uh, first mover advantage. In a sense, they anticipate the downstream firms are going to compensate for their decisions. Right? So the upstream firms essentially move first in that, in that sense. And so it, it creates this asymmetry in the payoffs that you get. So upstream firms tend to earn more profit than downstream firms in this type of model. Um, I do want to say, however, that this model is, is actually uh, one of the great strengths of this model is that it's really intuitive. And um, the way that I've presented it here, I've sort of given you my notation. But if you read the original paper, it's written in a more neoclassical style. And in that style, they work with demand functions. And they, uh, Salinger, in particular, presents this model as one where the downstream firms essentially induce a hypothetical demand curve for the upstream firms that the upstream firms then respond to. So if you read that original paper, it's formulated in this nice, intuitive way. Um, but again, this type of, of scenario does have some disadvantages. We have this asymmetry that, that may not be motivated by, by what we see happening. Um, it's, again, not a well-formed game structure. And they limit themselves to a linear demand curve. So at this point, I want to show you how to turn what we've done into a true uh, game theoretic game. So the intuition for this um, is something like this. If, if you're a firm in a supply chain industry, you really have to believe that when you adjust your output, firms in different parts of the supply chain are going to compensate somehow. They're also going to adjust their outputs. This, this is really necessary for any of these games actually to work, to be realistic. Um, in fact, Salinger in his original paper said exactly that. He said, you know, if a firm sells an extra unit of its good, uh, it has to assume that a final good producer also increases its output by one unit. So it turns out that this, this simple fact that seems, you know, fairly intuitive is actually embedded within, I think, every uh, model of supply chain competition that's out there. The problem is that it's actually been hidden in these other models. It's, it's defined implicitly. It's been actually implicit in those beliefs of firms when you're defining the core no equilibrium. Hidden within those beliefs is this notion that firms throughout the supply chain are actually making an adjustment. Um, so in order to actually turn this into a game, we need to define payoffs when all of these changes happen, which means that we have to make this explicit now. We have to define exactly what happens to different quantity flows throughout the whole chain when firms in one of these markets make an adjustment. And because we need the quantities to match, essentially what this tells us is that we can't have the firms choose quantities directly. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you my idea for fixing this, which is essentially a change of variables. But I wanted to mention this first, because what I'm about to do is, is kind of unorthodox um, in, in terms of economics. But I just want to point out that this is really a necessary feature. Um, all, all that we're doing is encoding something that I think is necessary for a, a supply chain model to work and actually quite intuitive. So let's go back to Cornell competition for a moment. Here we have firms choosing their quantities, and they're going into this demand function. Instead of focusing on the quantities, let's, let's focus on how much the firms don't produce. So look at the other side of this market. Um, so here we have another quantity. That look, look at this arrow from the maximum demand. So um, I'll use the capital X there to represent the maximum possible supply that these firms could hypothetically produce, at least the maximum that they could produce without driving the price below zero. Um, now, this depends on what happens in the other markets, right? This is not necessarily a constant. It's a constant as long as the firms in the other markets aren't changing what they're doing. So what I think we should do is take that quantity, the maximum, divide it up among the n different firms in this market. We'll split it evenly. And then we'll let each firm decide how much less than that to produce. So we'll call that a restriction, a quantity restriction. I'll use the xi with a hat over it to be how much the firm restricts its quantity. 
So I know this is unorthodox, but if you stop and think about it, there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between quantities and restrictions. So for every set of quantities, there's a corresponding set of quantity restrictions that produces the exact same output. So mathematically speaking, we actually haven't changed this game. Um, so technically speaking, the new game is actually isomorphic to the original Cournot game, and we don't expect from behaviors to be any different. We've essentially rewritten this in, in just a different format. Of course, the difference now is that we have this maximum amount x that can change in response to quantity changes in other markets. So what we do is we sort of sum these quantity restrictions together across markets so that the total quantities always match. If firms in another output change their outputs, then this capital X changes within this market, um, and these firms automatically adjust their quantities. So what we've done is, is we've recreated Corno competition in the narrow sense that as long as firms within other markets are not actively changing, firms within this market have to be in the Corno equilibrium. So how do we turn this into a game? Well, I have to add three different assumptions. Um, and I hope that these are as intuitive as, as possible. Uh, the first one, again, is market clearance. Right? So just like before, we need the final price of each, of each good as determined through the, markets, through the markups. It's equal to price from the demand function. Right? This is what we need for the market to clear. Um, we need an assumption about market interaction. And essentially, this says that the markets interact with each other just through price signals. Right? So you change the quantity at one market. That can change the flow in another market, but not the markup at that other market. And finally, we need a baseline assumption. Um, this, this one might be a little bit more artificial, but it just says that we need somewhere to essentially anchor the model to generate results. So the baseline that we have is if the total restriction at a market is zero, then the profit is zero. So the firms have to restrict to some amount in order to earn positive profit. So the first main result says that you know, there's a unique set of prices that fulfills all three of these assumptions. So once you have a unique set of prices, you can define payoffs, and you have an actual game. You have an actual game theoretic structure. So I'm going to call this a coupled Cournot supply chain game. So I can finally, I'm allowed to use the word game, because this is, in fact, a well-formed game in the economic sense. Uh, you might wonder at this point, this, I, this seems different right, from what we had before. Uh, it has a very different flavor than the unmatched Cournot supply chain setup. So you might worry that we've done something very different. It turns out it's not very different at all. It turns out, as the second major result actually says, that the equilibria are the same. So those matched equilibria that we computed before for the uncoupled game are exactly the Nash equilibria for the new coupled game. So essentially what we've done is reformulated this game in a new form such that it has a nice game theoretic structure. And this is a good thing. I mean, to, to have a well-formed game, you know, we can use the standard solution concepts. We can use Nash equilibria, um, Bayesian perfect, uh, reformulations of Nash equilibria. We have all the mechanics of game theory that we've been building up um, at the time that we've studied game theory. We can also do things like change the game timings. We have different firms move first. Maybe we want to represent things like aggressive managers. Uh, we also get all of our standard existence results. So that means as long as the demand is continuous, the payoffs are continuous, we're guaranteed to have at least one equilibrium. So for all of these you know, reasons, the mathematical formalism can assist us as we actually uh, study real markets. I have one, one more uh, limitation that I told you guys about that I haven't addressed yet, and that's the demand function. So, so far, we've just had linear demand. Um, the last thing I want to do mathematically is extend this model so that it works for a much larger class of demand functions. So the class of demand functions that I want to extend to is, is really essentially every demand that you could meet through markups at these market edges. So we'll say that demand R is compatible with supply chain G. Um, if you can find any markups at all, so let's call them a markup T at edge E, such that the sum uh, for each final product uh, the, uh, the, the total price of each final product can be found by summing the markups at its edges. So actually, I have another formulation that, um, that also guarantees this. So there's, there's this condition that this lemma says, which gives you another way to arrive at the same thing. So uh, one of these demands is compatible with G um, if this condition is met. If any time you have two different you know, vectors of final products, so bundles of final products, um, that actually induce the same quantity flow, right, the same flow over each edge, 
Well, you need the resulting prices for each good to be the same. And you also need the total revenues for each uh, overall firms to be equal. So as long as you have these two conditions met, uh, you have a demand function that's compatible. So it definitely doesn't have to be linear anymore. It, it essentially just has to be expressible in some way over, through markups at each market edge. Well, it turns out that for this general class of demand functions, we can do the exact same thing. Um, well, not exactly the same thing. Before, I had three assumptions. And, and three is a better number. But now we actually have to have four assumptions to actually make this work. Um, a lot of these, they have to be written in a slightly more complicated form, but a lot of these are familiar. We have market clearance again. Uh, we have market interaction. So again, they have to interact through prices. The baseline is almost the same. Um, if the total restriction at a market node is zero, now the, the maximum profit there has to be equal to zero. And it seems like we've added this linearity assumption. So this says that if you look at quantity restrictions that yield the same flow, uh, you need prices to be linear in restrictions. Um, it's a little bit of a technical assumption. I, I know that it seems new here. It turns out that this assumption uh, was actually hidden within the other assumptions of the simpler theorem for the linear case. So even though it looks like a new assumption, it was actually there all along. Um, and, and I've just made it explicit here. So once again, we can find the unique set of prices. And again, you know, we can yield the, the coupled Corneau supply chain gain. So those are, those are all, the, the, all the mathematics that I want to go over today. Um, finally, I want to end. Uh, th this last supply chain is, is actually producing commentary on the net neutrality debate. So I, I wanted to end with, with an example. So in, in some ways, this is, uh, you know, th th in some ways, it's a bad example because uh, net neutrality is, is controversial and it's, it's tough to sort of give a, give a very short sort of, um, uh, or make a short statement about it. Um, but in other ways, it's sort of a good example because it's a space with a lot of interesting supply chains, a, a lot of topological complexity. Um, and, so, and it sort of gives this, um, gives this framework sort of a chance to sort of stretch out a little bit. So in order to talk about this, I'm actually going to have to spend a few minutes uh, describing the network industry. So this is a crash course. Um, in computer networking, um, sort of the high-level view for, from 10,000 feet in just a few minutes. So here we have a, a very high-level depiction of the internet. We have a couple of internet service providers. And if you're this end user here, you want to get on the internet, well, you actually have to buy a contract for network access, right, from one of these residential access networks. Um, and I've only drawn two of them up here because that's most people in this country have it, only two choices for broadband residential access. It's your cable provider uh, and your DSL provider. Well, over here, we have another group of players. These are your service providers. So these are, these are companies. They may be content providers. They could be search engines, um, YouTube and, and Netflix and, and Google and so forth. Um, they also have to buy a contract in order to connect to the internet. Um, it actually has a different name. Uh, this is called a transit contract. Um, but in a sense, it's similar to the network contract. The transit contract essentially gives them the right to send data to any user uh, anywhere on the internet. So once they have this transit contract, you know, this is starting to look a lot like a supply chain. Um, once they have the transit contract, they can then sell the service onto the end user. Um, you'll notice, however, this, this industry looks very asymmetric, right? Um, this user only has a choice of two different network providers. But there's actually a large number of transit providers that could theoretically sell transit to each of these service providers. Right? There's at least, um, I forget the number, 9 or 10 or 11 tier 1 transit providers in this country, a whole number of, of, of smaller transit providers and so forth. So it's no surprise that transit fees have really dropped precipitously over time. So here I have a graph of what transit fees look like. I'm sorry, this is hard tree. This stretches back to 1998. So in every year that this data was collected, uh, transit fees have actually dropped by over 40%, uh, or at least the average drop over this time period was over 40% per year. <clears throat> so you can imagine you know, if, if you know, economists like simple, simple math. So when economists look at this scenario and they want to model interactions in this industry, well, one choice might be to assume a sort of a transit price that's really small and perhaps falling towards zero. Um, but as economists, we like to make life easier for ourselves. And so typically, what actually happens is we assume that the transit price is actually zero. Um, so this is really um, 
an idealistic or a hypothetical scenario that's known as the zero price rule in the literature. You can think of it as really an approximation of where the industry is headed today. Um, and because the transit fees are relatively small compared to the other quantities that are at play in this industry, uh, we, we believe that this is a reasonable approximation of where the industry is. Um, another way to express that is that there's no payments between the network and the service providers in this, in this industry. Well, at this point, you can see this, this looks like a very simple supply chain. It's one that we can model. And I can port that into the, the framework that I've been showing you. So uh, here's, here's what that might look like. And of course, this is the supply chain that, that I was demonstrating with earlier. So in this supply chain, we have M service goods, service one through service M. There's two network goods, network one, network M. Those are both sold in markets directly to consumers. And the consumer needs both. Right, so a final product in this scenario has to consist of a network good and a service good. Well, we can run through the computations. Um, I'm going to spare you from, from all of the, the mathematics here. Um, I just threw up the, the final you know, market results here because I mainly want to show you that we have really nice, simple, closed form solutions. The algebra yields really nice solutions. Uh, it turns out that when you add more service firms um, to the service industry, that the profits of those service firms fall. Um, but the profits of the network firms actually rise. So that, that seems intuitive, really, because if the service firms have market power, they extract more profit, and they essentially squeeze out the network firms. They, they push the demand curve for the network firms downward, so they have less profit available. As I'll show you in just a moment, we could do fancier things here. We can do things like measure incentives for new technologies. So we can do things like imagine a new technology for a service provider. We call that an innovation. And we just measure how much more profit that service provider would have in the market um, if they adopted that technology. And that's what we call the incentive for that service innovation. I'll, I'll show you a graph of those in just a moment. Um, right now, we want to consider what other markets might take the place of the zero price rule. So you might remember that the neutrality debate really got started, or at least it really got going, um, in 2005. And this is when the CEO of AT&T uh, made some rather colorful uh, comments in an interview. And he said that you know, these small service providers, the, you know, Google and Yahoo and so forth, um, they wanted to use AT&T's pipes for, for free. And there had to be some mechanism right, for them to pay for the portion that they're using. So there's a, you know, this, there's a lot of ways that you could understand this statement. right? Um, this isn't sort of an economically precise statement. But a lot of people looked at this statement, and they felt worried because they understood that in some form, AT&T wanted to sell some new type of good right, to, to service providers, some new type of contract. Um, there's no name for this at the moment because it, it hasn't been put into practice yet. But um, I had to come up with a name for it. I, I decided to call it Passage for now. Um, and, and again, it's not clear exactly what the CEO meant. But a lot of people looked at this, and they, they thought that AT&T wanted to sell the right for service providers to reach customers, but just AT&T's customers. So in this formulation passage, it would be the right to send data just to the specific network's users. And in a sense, that's problematic, because that means that if these service providers want to reach all users, well, they would have to purchase a separate passage contract from, from both residential access networks. So um, complicating matters, uh, oh, oh, sorry, so once they once they have, it's only after they have these passes contracts that once again we can complete the supply chain. They can sell the service. Um, complicating things a little farther, we could imagine different structures for these passage contracts. They could be uniform. There could just be one price for a universal type of service. They could be differentiated as well. So they, they, there could be multiple prices for different classes of service. Actually, most of the papers that, that are prominent in the field of net neutrality compare two of these three regimes that I just showed you. Um, so partly because of the difficulty of modeling with, with the economic tools that we have, uh, there's actually no paper that looks at all three of these different types of markets that I put up here. Um, different papers apply different types of economic tools to compare uh, two of these. Making matters even more complicated, there's still other directions that the industry could go in. Another possibility is that AT&T, again, you know, sells a service directly to service providers. But maybe it offers service providers the opportunity to reach all of the customers through this contract. Right? Essentially, this is a transit contract again. 
except it's a transit contract where there's only two options um, for where to buy it from. Right? It's as though AT&T rewrote its peering agreements with all of the other T1 providers so that nobody else has the right to sell transit anymore, only the residential access networks. So this is something you might call the duopoly price rule because the price is now only constrained by this duopoly competition between the access networks. So you can take all of these um, different scenarios that I've depicted, put it into the supply chain model, and come up with um, an estimation of market results. So there, there's a lot that, that could go into this. I'll just highlight a small number of results for you today. Um, we can compare prices that end users receive. Here you have a graph of the total end user price. And you can see it changes with the number of service providers. The more service providers, of course, the, the more competition there is, and the price does fall. Um, you can also see that the most neutral network, the, the zero price rule, always features the lowest prices, and passage fees feature the highest prices. So we're looking at a baseline with just one technology here. So for this comparison, uh, the uniform and the differentiated passage fees are actually the same because we only have one type of passage technology. We can also look at the network profits. So <clears throat> much as the network providers fear, the most neutral network leaves them with the lowest amount of money. Right? This, this may not be too surprising from the, from the, the, the debate that we hear. Um, both of the alternative regimes would increase their profits. And the one that increases their profits most actually depends on the number of service providers. So there's some, there's some interesting mechanics that happens there. We could also look at the incentives that service firms have to deploy new technologies. So here on this axis, we have the strength of a technology that, that a service provider is thinking about implementing. Um, it turns out that the most neutral network actually gives the highest incentive, the highest reward to a service provider that implements that new technology. The passage fees seem to do worse. Um, the duopoly price rule is interesting. It does have less incentive for innovation, um, but it's not nearly as bad as the passage fee. So it really seems to depend on exactly what type of industry we move into. And finally, we have incentives for the networks to upgrade the infrastructure. And this is where there's actually a surprise, because if you listen to the debate, it sounds like net neutrality is a, is a tension between innovation and services and um, deployment of nice new networks by the network providers. They, they say that they need to charge differentiated services and so forth because they want to fund our new next generation fancy networks. Right? But as you can see here, the most neutral network, the zero price rule, actually results in the highest incentive for network upgrading. And this is, even, this is strange because it's even though in the baseline, in the base case, they have the lowest profits. Um, but what happens here is that the neutral network essentially puts these network providers in a very strict horizontal form of competition. So even though they have little profit to start with, um, the network provider that implements a network upgrade can differentiate itself from its competitor and gain a large market share very quickly, and that, that increases its, its reward. Um, well, those are all the results for now. Um, I just want to leave you with three quick takeaways. Uh, the first is that I hope after this talk you, you appreciate the fact that, in fact, supply chains are still relevant, um, that they're actually appearing more and more in, in information industries, industries that, that are just developing today, um, but they can get quite complicated, and so we do need to investigate tools that can analyze supply chains at the level of graph topology. Um, and I've shown you one attempt that I've, that I've conducted to do that here today. Um, finally, the last thing is that, you know, I just think more generally, on a, on a sort of a general level, uh, supply chains are just one example of how topology actually is important in information industries. And so I think tools that can recognize graph topology are a really promising avenue, a really uh, promising addition to the economics toolkit that I think is, is, is a good direction to move in. So thank you guys so much. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to have your questions. Your sort of tack, you, in, in the last part about net neutrality, that there were three different approaches and nobody's done attack, uh, uh, attempted to examine all of them. So are you saying that you're sort of the person who's attempting to examine all of them? Yeah, I think, yes, exactly. I think the strength of this type of modeling 
is, is that be, because, the, um, because the supply chain starts with these you know, simple building blocks, it, it's, it, it allows it to, to actually extend to cover these complicated technologies. So the same simple building blocks can, can extend to cover um, really a large number of different industries that, that you could imagine. So instead of trying to model industries, uh, I, I, I don't know the right words to use, maybe in a more ad hoc sense, um, we, all we have to do is, is write down what the supply chains look like, and then we have a more universal tool that can tr try to capture all of those. Oh, thank you. I haven't talked to them yet, so <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they will. <laughs> One of the things, it was a very interesting talk, but one of the things, if I may, not being an economist, is that the, your um, sort of second assumption in both attempts reflects is that this is all to do with price. And so price and quantity, what therefore gets left out is quality. Mm -hmm. And yet it seems to me that when you look at supply chains, two, one of the most important things is who asserts the quality of the goods that come through the supply chain. Yes. And therefore, you'll see a lot of supply chains are in many ways controlled by who controls the trademark over the, or the brands. Brands control supply chains. And indeed, it, when you came to the end and you talked about um, incentives for innovation, mm -hmm. you suddenly suggested that by improving your quality of service, you would therefore get better rewards. So quality suddenly came in at the end, having been missing from my point of view from the rest. What would happen if you factored quality, absolutely, rather than quantity and price? Into this argument? Well, the yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that's a good observation. So, in fact, um, when you take a model that that describes consumers in terms of, of a demand function, then it's natural to try to uh, to find the quality within the demand. So that's exactly what I did in terms of the the. Uh, the incentive part of this. So exactly, uh, you, you actually take the demand function and you rewrite the demand function. You write the demand function in terms of the size of this innovation. And you say, well, um, the quality has to be felt in the price that the user is uh, willing to pay. So that's the level that quality can actually um, uh, go into this model. Um, you, you also, I, part of what you said sounded like an informational problem that, that, uh, well, that different. I, 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 Yeah, yeah. I yeah. would Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, branding could also go into the model, I think, in a similar way. Um, I haven't attempted to do anything that, that approximates a limited information. So it sounds like part of what you're saying might be that we have limited information about the quality of, of different goods. Um, and, and to that extent, I haven't, I haven't attempted to work anything like that into the model. Yes. Right. Right. Diminish the return to Dell or Compaq and enormously boost the Dell return. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great. That's actually a great uh, supply chain example uh, to think about because I indeed that's that's a case where the upstream supplier was very much visible to consumers, and and you have different upstream suppliers that that very much would would yield a different demand um, once once you factor in the final product. So you could do both. You could have it. Right, right, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And and now that you're talking about it, that's I, I feel like that should be the next supply chain that I that I want to actually put into this because that's actually a really nice. It, it seems like there's a lot of really cool features there that that yeah that, that we could explore. Yeah.
I would just like to perhaps react to, to Paul's example that maybe uh, in the case of Intel, there may in fact be some uh, actual transfer or subsidy uh, either explicitly or hidden between Intel and its downstream uh, customers. And that may be something that I'm wondering wh whether that type of uh, site payments would be, you, you can actually model them within your framework mm -hmm. and what type of insights that might yield for this particular situation where you know, actually the market power can be exercised in alternate ways, uh, particularly where there is asymmetry in quality between Intel and AMD and whoever else mm -hmm. in the market. Oh, which way do the, the subsidies from? Uh, so so uh, yeah, I, I'm just wondering. So, so you have Intel and you have a competitor, right? So they occupy this upstream market. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is some perception that differences in quality or branding can lead to different demands uh, on the consumer side. So maybe there is a different way in which market power could be exercised uh, through an explicit payment, a site payment. Well, I, I, I understand this is deviating from, from, from your model, but it seems like maybe, perhaps I'm wondering if your model could be generalized to account for that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I have played around a little bit. So it, it is possible. Um, I, I, I could see a couple of ways to model that, actually, because it, it's, I, I, again, I, it, it seems to me that the demand specification is a very general format for modeling consumers. So a lot of those effects, I, I feel like, maybe could be expressed through the correct formulation for consumer demand. But maybe, maybe that's because I'm not fully understanding the exact example. It's also true that you could take a basic Cournot model um, and just like you can do things like alter the, the timing of players' decision, because of the flexibility here, um, it is possible to throw in things like a Bertrand component or, or price component that, that goes into one part of the supply chain. Um, I've been trying to push the supply chain, so I've been trying to sort of try to depict everything in terms of quantities. Um, but if for modeling reasons or for reasons of realism, you, you felt like parts of the market were better depicted as prices, uh, it would be possible to do that too. You could take part of the supply chain and, and, and use prices there instead. Um, I think she might have said that that was the last bite. But <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank, thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it.